Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the British Nigeria Law Forum Junior Lawyers Division the BNLF GLD webinar. And we'll be speaking on the constitutional safeguards of the Nigerian citizen, insights from the NSAS um, protest by an expert. I am your host, Izuchuku Temilade John. I'm a student of the Nigerian Law School, Yola Campus, and a member of the BNLF GLD Planning Group. For those that do not know much about the British Nigeria Law Forum, it is a bilateral organization which serves as a communication forum for British and Nigerian lawyers for their mutual benefit and the promotion of legal ideals. The BNLF is recognized by the Law Society, the Solicitors Regulation Authority, the Bar Standards Board, and the Nigerian Bar Association, NBA. BNLF has a number of divisions including the Junior Lawyers Division, the Business Law Division, Family Law Division, and an Immigration Law Division. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the BNLF website and YouTube channel should you choose to watch it again. Kindly feel free to ask any questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and I'll put forward the questions to the speaker. Please tweet at us by using the hashtags, hashtag BNLF and hashtag BNLFGLD. Now we have before us an experienced speaker, DG Ajari. DG Ajari is an experienced legal practitioner with over 16 years of experience and advocacy. He's currently the Deputy Executive Director of Access to Justice for Nigeria. In the course of his work, he has collaborated with the National Human Rights Commission, the Legal Aid Council, the National Agency for Prohibition of Traffic in Persons, and Amnesty International, amongst others. DG, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Izuchuku. Um, I'm glad to be here tonight. Okay, thank and you very much. Thanks for having me here. Yes, and so we begin. Using the recent NSAS protest, which was a response to widespread allegations of police brutality in Nigeria, what exactly does the Constitution say as regards the rights of the Nigerian citizen? Okay. Um, thank you again. Um, and I welcome everybody here tonight. Talking about the constitution and the rights guaranteed under our constitution. Um, there are sets of rights that are considered as very essential to protect our dignity. They are called the fundamental rights. The constitution recognizes them and provides for them and uh, to ensure equal and fair treatment of citizens before the law. The rights are very basic to the advancement of the human race. They are called fundamental rights. Their are, are applications are basically meant to distinguish between humans and animals. And the recognition of these rights have been so instrumental in bringing humans from the stone age to the present age. Among all, the right to life and the right to liberty is considered to be some of the most basic. Now, let me just um, talk, just, uh, I will not bore us too much in going into details, but some of the rights that are protected under the Constitution, particularly as it relates to the issue in this course today, the right to life, the right to dignity of human person, the right to personal liberty, the right to fair hearing, the right to privacy, right to freedom of expression and the press, the right to peaceful assembly and association, the right to freedom of movement and freedom from discrimination. I would just speak generally about this because what you will find is that the nature of fundamental rights generally make as such that they are indivisible, they are inalienable. 
and they are universal. In other words, the rights that you have here in Abuja is the rights that I would have in Lagos, the rights that you would have in Kano, and the rights you would have in Yola. They are the rights you would have in the United States of America. They are the rights you would have in the United Kingdom. They are the rights you would have in Ukraine. They are the rights you are going to have in Saudi Arabia. Because it is not because they are contained in any constitution that they form those rights. It is because they are fundamental to the nature of human existence. Now, they are also indivisible because you will find that the valuable enjoyment of one is connected to the other. If you take away one, the likelihood is that it's going to affect the enjoyment of the other. So if, for instance, you deprive me of a right to fair hearing, and in so doing, for instance, I am sentenced to a jail term. What it means is I have, by virtue of the deprivation of my right to fair hearing, I have also been deprived of my right to personal liberty. I have been made to go to detention when I do not deserve to. I have also been deprived of my right to dignity, the dignity of my person. So you will find that these rights are so interconnected that you can actually, it's, it's very difficult to separate the enjoyment of one from the other. Now, why is this issue important to speak about today? Because we are taking a case study of the NSAS movement to look at the issue of constitutional rights. You are going to find that a long thread of line of rights where conspicuously violated in the course of all of the events surrounding the NSAS protests. We will get to that shortly. However, I have talked about the nature of fundamental rights and Nigeria as a constitutional democracy has this right. The implication is those rights must and ought to be respected and enforced to the fullest. And failure to do so will actually affect the, our claim to being a constitutional democracy. Okay, DJ. Yes, please. Yep. Thank you very much for the brief introduction. I have a question, particularly as regards the right to liberty, because it seems as if our constitution just lays out these rights. And like you said, they are very fundamental and inalienable. Section 33 provides right to life, 34, right to human dignity, section 35, right to liberty, and so on and so forth. But it appears that in reality, these rights are not necessarily enforced. And they are not enforced or are complied with by law enforcement agents. For instance, Section 35, which provides for a right to liberty. I have a problem with the particular practice of the Nigerian police, which is the remand proceedings. Okay, so for our viewers, what remand proceedings basically is, is a section of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act says that the police can make application to the magistrate or to the I, to the High Court judge to remand a suspect for a certain number of days in police detention while the police carries out its investigation. But what goes on in Nigeria is that this particular application is being abused. The right to liberty in Section 35 states that a suspect arrested must be charged before a competent court of jurisdiction between 24 hours or maximum 48 hours, depending on the proximity of the police station to the courthouse. But we have a situation whereby police officers detain suspects for more than 48 hours. The recent case of El Motele, an NSAS protester who was detained for 10 days before being charged before court, is vivid and we can all relate to it. And so, after the police has detained these people, these suspects for more than 48 hours, they then go to the magistrates to apply for remand proceedings. And what is particularly interesting and baffling at the same time is that it's tried 
that the magistrate courts in Nigeria cannot try capital offenses. And so, but we know that the Nigerian police has the habit of charging capital offenses before magistrate courts, knowing fully well that the magistrate court will deny jurisdiction. And when they do that and the magistrate court denies jurisdiction, they then apply for remand proceedings and keep the suspects indefinitely in their detention cells. This practice has to stop because it's in breach of the Nigerian constitution. So what do you think has to be done as regards that DG, or what proposals do you have concerning that? Thank you, um, Zoe, again. Uh, you see, the first, it's an understanding of the social contracts would help, you know, where we know that citizens have conferred certain authority on those who are leaders and then retain certain rights for themselves. And it is on these rights that the citizens have, it is these rights that the citizens have that are the limits of the powers of the leadership in every democracy. So you find a situation where constantly our leaders seek to, it's, it's, it's like a box. How do I describe like a box? So this is the maximum of the limits. So if this part of it shrinks, then this part increases. If this part increases, if this part decreases, this part increases. So it's simple. So the more of the rights of the citizens that are taken away, the more powers the leadership ascribe to themselves. And constantly, there is the desire to reduce the rights of the citizens. There is the desire to repress and take away rights of citizens. Now, I would tell you, for instance, just as a, uh, just for clarification of this issue, you would see, you would have noticed in the past few years, a consistent attempt by the government to enact laws which clearly are aimed at shrinking the civic space, the social media bill, the NGO regulatory bill, the, the, uh, 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 and so or many other bills like that, that the citizens have consistently come out to cry about. And even uh, now, you would see that, despite all of the arguments that there are existing laws that can take, clearly take care of all of these things that you complain about. But you see that consistent desire to reduce, to shrink that civic space. That's the desire of the government. Now, back to the issue of remand. That is an issue uh, that, fortunately, I am very interested in and I am doing some work, uh, or we're doing some work at, at Access to Justice on right now. The Administration of Criminal Justice Act which is applicable in the FCT and other federal jurisdiction and the administration of criminal justice laws of most of the states that have passed it make remand provisions. Now, I will briefly try to explain the history of the remand provisions. Before the administration of criminal justice um, act came, we, there was a practice within by, by police prosecutors where they will take uh, where there are where there are offenses that cannot be tried, for instance, by a magistrate, but by a high court judge, and they are not yet ready to arraign them properly before a high court. They will take suspects to a before a magistrate court to uh, to file what they call a holding charge. Now that holding charge is funny because there is nowhere it is provided for in our law that such a thing called holding charge can be done it was no but somehow the practice started and then somehow it became ingrained despite um repeated pronouncements of the superior courts that um, um holding charge is something that is unknown to our law it continued unabated and so i think the complaints and the excuses the police gave was what led to the uh, inclusion of the remand um Pro remand the provisions in the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. So basically, it legalized what was what used to be called the holding charge, sort of. However, it made provisions for how 
it should be uh, administered. Because what used to happen then when we had holding charges that somebody comes with, the, once they come and they get a holding charge and they take a person to prison, they dump him and abandon him there and they never go back. They never bother to go back to the high court to file proper suits, to file proper charges against the suspect. So you find suspects spend upward without any formal charge uh, against them. It was this mischief that was intended to be cured by, okay, formalizing it and making provisions for the administration of this process. However, till date, I will tell you in most jurisdictions, like I said, Access to Justice is currently working on a project which is interested in these remand protocols in FCT, Lagos, and uh, Anambra State. And what we have found out from the researches we have conducted is that a lot of magistrates who still sit and um, grant remand orders for persons still do not follow the procedures that are laid down by the various um, act, the act and the various laws. Because the act, for instance, will make provisions that a person can be remanded in the first instance for a maximum period of um, 14 days. However, um, as recent as two weeks ago, in one of the cases that came out emerged from the NSAS protests, a magistrate remanded suspect brought before him and adjourned the case to January 2021, a period that naturally um, is running close to 90 days. What it means is that the intendment of those who made the law that a person would not be remanded for more than 15 days in the first instance, unless there is good cause to now further extend it, which the magistrate will request or require of the police to show, and in fact notify the, the director of public prosecution or the attorney general of, has been, has obviously been defeated. And so one would now worry whether indeed um, uh, the idea of lawmaking is of any value whatsoever, as to what my thoughts would be, what my suggestions would be for correcting this uh, anomaly. Is what my thoughts are things that we have already put out there. We think it is important that the chief judges of the various states make practice directions very detailed practice directions that will administer, the, you know, protocols for the administration of the remand, uh, the remand, uh, uh, remand system under the administration of criminal justice. Act. Those are thoughts. And um, again, of course, we'll go back to one most important thing: impunity. There must be, there must be, there must be accountability. For every time a magistrate errs, for every time a magistrate goes outside the law, it is important that they are made to be accountable. Until that happens, you are not going to find judges sitting up and ensuring that their decisions, their rulings, and their judgments are strictly based on law and nothing more. Thank you very much, DG. Okay, so I I, I was going to talk about I, I was going to talk about um you know, I, I was talking about the, the uh, actions of governments generally, which okay. are, of course, is, is essentially have been aimed at shrinking the rights of citizens, the right to freedom of speech, the right to personal liberty and right to freedom of association. And I said that, you see, it is ironic that the NSAS protests started as a result of what citizens perceived as violation, persistent violation of their fundamental rights by the notorious special anti-robbery squad of the Nigerian police force. Ironic that the protests of the citizens against violation of their rights, these protests themselves, which are, of course, clearly fundamental rights and constitutional rights, 
and protected rights. And in, in, in exercising their lawful rights, citizens had further rights violated. It's ironic because it is a display of a total lack of um, a total lack of um, willingness or lack of understanding of the nature of the contract between the citizenry and the government by the government. It's, it's simply um, uh, just imagine a situation where a man and a woman are married, legally speaking, say, under the act. And one of the parties is not aware that they are married. They think they're just friends or they are just neighbors. It's exactly what you have. And it is naturally, naturally, because there is that lack of understanding of the relationship between them, you are going to find um, there will definitely be discord. Because for instance, if say uh, one of the partners <laughs> is interested in uh, exercising his or her conjugal rights, and the other, neighbor, you cannot come into my room tonight because I don't think you're my husband, you're my wife, or something. And then, so naturally, you're going to have issues. That is exactly what we have here in Nigeria today because the government does not recognize that the rights that the citizens are demanding and asking for are actually rights that they ought, that they have, not because the government wants to give it to them. But they have the virtue of And in fact, without those rights, there is no government. Citizens now step out. I have a lot of work on police brutality. And the anger that, was, that you saw on the streets in the protest is genuine. It is based on stories. I have been a victim myself. I lost my brother-in-law to police brutality, and we are still on it up until today. And I tell you that I have handled several cases of police brutality. I have handled several cases where persons were permanently damaged. And guess what? Nobody gets to suffer for it. That lack of accountability encourages him that impunity. So a, SAS, a policeman arrests you, and even when you're not telling, oh, I need to know, uh, please, can you identify yourself, or do you have a search warrant? He'll tell you, look at you. I'll kill you, and nothing will happen. Because they can do it, and really, nothing would happen. So citizens came out to protest that these mm -hmm. violations are too much, these violations are too systematic, these violations are too repressive, and we, needed, we need them to stop. But government's response was to further violate the right of citizens. Actually, all of the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution were violated. I will tell you, for instance, the right to life was violated. Several persons were killed in the course of the protest. The right to dignity of human persons. Now, some of these people were rough handled, manhandled by security agencies. As we saw videos, we saw live videos, and it was disheartening that law enforcement agents will think it is part of their duty to harass and molest peaceful protesters. The right to personal liberty, several of them were detained for no just cause. And till date, as we speak, several of these people are still in detention. A lot of these persons, their right to private and family lives were infringed upon I am going to tell you the story of someone who is still currently in detention, who was arrested by the Department of State uh, Services, Imole Ayo. There's a hashtag for his real guy, for there is a campaign currently going on on social media. Imole Ayo was, his, his right to private and family life was flagrantly infringed upon by men of the Directorate of State, State Security Services, who came into his house at 2.30 a.m. in the middle of the night without a warrant of arrest came in, disturbed the peaceful enjoyment of his private and family life, eventually took him in the dead of night without any information to his family as to who they were and where they were taking him to. And we have several more cases like this. In fact, some persons are missing that nobody know where they are. Now, the right to freedom of expression and the press, that is the one that amazed me the most. After all of this, in the middle of all of this, and despite the, uh, in my opinion, the very professional nature 
with which the Nigerian media, I would say professional, uh, but, and if anything at all, I saw them even leaning towards a very careful representation of issues during the protest. But guess what? The Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation, a few days thereafter, slammed several um, uh, of the media houses with fines. Why? For, purported, for purportedly reporting, may reporting the NSAS, uh, 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 NSAS protest in such a way that it does not favor the Nigerian government. Who does that in a democracy? The right to freedom of expression and the press is not one that we should toy with because without access to this information, without access to what is going on, citizens cannot even enjoy all of these other rights. It is when you know how your government is being run, it is when you know how, um, um, the, what, what, who, are, who is doing what, when and how, that you are able to ask questions as citizens. But government is hell-bent on doing what? On muffling the press, on ensuring that, and you will see, eventually, they succeeded in scaring the press. A lot of the issues that went down were not reported. They were, they were you know, walking, they were tiptoeing around the issues until we had the foreign press come in and then agitate the government. It was only then that we got the government talking. Government had succeeded in scaring even uh, uh, protest witnesses to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to some of the atrocities that were committed during the protest. A lot of them are running out of the country. Those others that are still here are going underground. Those who lost their family members are unable to come out to speak because they are scared. Now you would understand what I meant when I said these rights are such that the enjoyment or absence of the enjoyment of one usually affects the other. So you cannot even separate these rights from themselves. They are one and the same. If you want to enjoy one, then you must enjoy all. You can't give me some of my rights and take some of them. It reminds um, one of uh, Fela's um, song. Uh, he's, I'm a very big fan of Fela, by the way. Where he said, animal won't give me human rights. You cannot give me human rights. Because you cannot give human rights. Human rights is not uh, acquired by virtue of somebody else giving it to you. It is acquired the day you are born. The moment you start breathing life, you acquire human rights. Once you become human, you have rights. And those rights cannot be taken. Even you cannot give up your rights as it is. An individual cannot give up his rights. It is beyond individuals to give up their rights. So, the end SARS protest uh, became a, a, a sore point in the history of our country. It exposed government's uh, total uh, unwillingness to listen to the voice of reason in uh, response to protests against violations of rights. Government did what? Government went ahead to uh, violate more rights. Well, like I have said, the rights are a fundamental part of the rights to freedom of speech and association. By the constitutional nature of that right, as long as we are peaceful, you and I have the right to gather at any time of the day to protest anything we feel we are not comfortable with. We are free, we should be free, to gather at any time, one or two people, even one, an individual, to protest whatever it is we believe is a breach or a violation of our rights. They are, they are, they are not things, because um, after the protests, or, or by the time the protests were hijacked, Thereafter, I heard uh, the president said, um, oh, he cannot permit the protest to continue. And I tell you that, you see, it is like, like I said earlier, it is a lack of understanding of the nature of the relationship between the government and the citizens. The government, the president does not have the power to allow citizens to protest or not. He does not have the powers to decide whether the citizens should protest or not. It is not for him to decide. Nope, it is not. Citizens have that right to protest. And because 
um, the, well, of course, according to the government, they acceded to the five demands of the protesters. I do not know. One thing I am sure of is that I did not see all those five demands uh, uh, implemented on ground. And given by the antecedents of the government, going by the antecedents of the government, it is not, un it is not unreasonable for those citizens who were protesting not to trust the government. It is not unreasonable. I mean, I have been involved in um, advocacy for police reforms over the years, and consistently we have heard, uh, we have had governments, successive governments, make promises. Successive presidents, successive IT inspector generals of police have made promises about reforms, but unfortunately, none of them have been implemented. Indeed, I will let you know the NSAS itself did not start in 2020. The NSAS movement started progressively from 2016. These campaigns went on quietly, but did not get the attention of the government. Uh, the few times that people would come out and protest, of course, as is usual, they would um, make some promises and then everybody goes back home. But this time around, uh, quite interestingly, the protests were organized. There was no face to reach. There were no leadership to be that could be uh, identified. So the government found it very difficult to call them and make their usual promises. And so the protesters, protesters continued. Rather than the government going down, sitting down, to find ways to quickly uh, start implementing those pr uh, promises it had made, it decided to repress and, uh, the rights of the citizens. And of course, you and I are witnesses to how that ended. It is a... It is a testimony, it is a testimony to the fact that, look, you cannot repress right of citizens, not perpetually. Sooner or later, citizens will wake up because they are humans and they will find out they are no longer living as humans. And the moment citizens, humans, realize that they are no longer living as humans, naturally they will fight back. They would fight back. It is government's response to the violence and uh, it's uh, recent, um, uh, the re recent uh, posturing of the government that uh, it will not uh, permit protest that is insensitive it is uh, it is it is not it is not reasonable the appropriate sensitive and democratic response should be to offer better protection to protesters and not to shut them down i say that because in fact ideally what the government should have done is that oh citizens who are protesting and exercising their fundamental human rights, we should ensure that they are protected as they do so. There should have been police and other security agencies who would have been guiding them. Recall that a few days into the protests, protesters were attacked by, uh, by, by touts. I remember in Bega, in Abuja, and then gradually this was how the whole thing went. This week we had a descent into violence, into mayhem, and because governments failed to protect the protesters. Thank you very much, DG. Okay, so you've highlighted that the infringement of one right definitely affects the infringement or affects the enjoyment of other rights. Now, I have a question, particularly regarding enforcing your human rights. Section 46 of the 1999 Constitution says that if your right is being infringed upon, that you have the right to approach the high court or to approach, yeah, to approach the high court or the federal high court as a court, as a court of coordinate jurisdiction, you have the, the right to approach the court for the enforcement of your rights. Well, however, it appears that getting judgment from the court is more or less a simple step. The whole do there is enforcing that judgment, which takes me to section 89 of the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act which deals with the enforcing judgments. Section 89 of the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act says that if you get judgment against an agency of the government, you need the permission of the Attorney General of the Federation to enforce judgment against such agency. And we all know that the Attorney General, stroke Minister of Justice, is the political appointee of the same president who is the head of the executive arm of government. And we've seen in the past that the various attorney, attorneys general have been irresponsible with this. They've shown loyalty to the president rather than loyalty to the constitution. As such, 
when a person who has gotten judgment against the police intends to enforce judgment against the police and by virtue of section 89 needs the permission of the attorney general to enforce such judgment we can see that such judgment will be futile and will be more or less useless so what do you think can be done to bypass this section 89 should section 89 be repealed by an amendment of the sheriff and civil process act if we do know which we know that the legislature has also not been responsible to listen to the cries of the people they represent so what exactly do you suggest and what exactly do you pro propose because section 89 seems to be a club on the wheel of enforcing your human rights against federal agencies who have breached them so what what are your thoughts on that dg absolutely Izu. I cannot agree with you less that Section 89 of the Sheriffs and Civil Process Act is a clock in the wheel of the is a clock in the wheel of is a clock in the wheel of administration of justice in Nigeria. I say this very clearly because Section 89 makes it makes it virtually impossible to enforce rights and it encourages impunity how does it do it you go to court because your rights have been violated you after of course going through the very hectic rigorous and um, almost you know almost discouraging legal process of judicial process of getting judgment and then eventually you get judgment say damages awarded against police for violation of right to dignity of human persons and then for you to enforce this judgment against the nigerian police you need to go to the attorney general of the federation and minister of justice to get his permission and the question is who does the nigerian police work for I am not in doubt, it is the president of Nigeria. Yes. It is the president of Nigeria that the Nigerian police work for. They don't work for you, they don't work for me. And then, who does the attorney general work for? The president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I do not see how the attorney general will very happily give consent for me to go and execute that judgment against the police. So in practice, you hardly get that consent. Because the Attorney General is a politician, is a minister appointed by the President at the will of the President, who can be fired by the President tomorrow. He can be fired by the President tomorrow. No, tonight. By just merely declaring that you are fired, he's fired. So the Attorney General will naturally will always constantly and consistently do what will protect the interest of the people who put him there. So now, by virtue of Section 89, what you are doing is that you have made the Attorney General a judge in his own cause, a violation of one of the two pillars of natural justice. Nemo Judex in cause Aswa, that you shall not be a judge in your own cause. It is not it's a no-brainer really that this is what we've been having i can tell you categorically i know of several judgments from municipal courts in nigeria from regional courts ECOWAS courts that have remained unenforceable not for any reason other than the fact that the attorney general has decided that no we're not going to give consent that's all and now you now ask yourself when the police know that they can do whatever they want to do, then you will go to go court and get a lawyer who is going to file for fundamental rights, who is going to file for everything, and then you go for years, and then you will get judgment, and the court will award damages of 10 million, 20 million, 100 million, 1 billion naira. And then you will carry the certificate of judgment around with you and not be able to do anything to them. Do you think that stops impunity? Does that actually 
encourages accountability encourage accountability i do not think so so like like i said you see it's like a an a, a systemic gang up against the citizens it's a systemic gang up against the citizens because if you succeed in overcoming one hurdle you find yourself facing the other hurdle because first the justice system the judicial system itself is a major hurdle for most people it is expensive it is tedious it is takes time it is not even friendly to those who approach it then you now have to get consent over to the general now let me now tell you one other one you will also now find yourself wanting to probably explore Ganeshi proceedings and then the central bank of nigeria will now start their own drama and then you find yourself not being able to access funds the cbn will come and tell you the police does not have money with it Meanwhile, the police does not have any account in any other, in any other place other than in the Central Bank of Nigeria. By virtue of the Treasury single account implemented by the government, there's no other account, at least none that people know of. So there are no funds to Ganeshi. So you find yourself battling the CBN again. Now, quite naturally, impunity continues. Why? Because there is no accountability. So, for me, my suggestion is clear, and we have done several, we have made several representations on this. Section 89 of the Sheriffs and Civil Process Act ought to be, right, to be, to be amended and expunged from that act outrightly. It is of no value. It is of no value whatsoever. We can only have that the day we decide to separate the office of the Attorney General from that of the Minister of Justice, who is a politician and a political office holder such that we will now institute a fair people people decided process for the selection of the attorney general a process that will not be influenced by politics and politicians a process that will ensure that the person occupying the office of attorney general is an independent arbiter and not one who is very willing and keen to bow to the whims and caprices of those who appointed him there. So it is important that one, that either we expunge that section from it through an amendment of the Sheriff's and Civil Process Act, or alternatively, we have constitutional amendments to separate the office of the Attorney General from that of the Minister of Justice and have a very fair system that's uh, through which the Attorney General is selected that will ensure that he will be accountable to the people and not to the president. Thank you very much, DG, for your suggestion and for your brilliant proposal. OK, so DG, the Constitution is clear. These rights have been provided for. But it appears that there are administrative bottlenecks that do not allow these rights to be enforced or to be enjoyed by the Nigerian citizen. Yeah. Like we've seen the remand proceedings and how it's being abused. We're also seeing here Section 89 of the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act, which more or less frustrates you and makes it impossible to enforce judgments gotten against the Nigerian police or whatever federal agency that has breached your rights. Now, I have a question also. Because if administrative bottlenecks can override the constitution and there's a very big problem during the NSAS protest lawyers providing legal aid made an outcry when they intended to bail out protesters who had been arrested they said there was no such database for the police in other words if a protester is alleged to have been arrested at shomoli police station when in fact he has been transferred or was arrested and detained at Jack Condi police station. You simply cannot know. You then have to go to each police station in Lagos State to search for an arrested suspect. Why doesn't the Nigerian police have the central database? Because if Section 35, which provides the right to leave, but it says that you must not be arrested for more than 24 hours or 48 hours maximum. And in the intent to enforce that, you do not even know 
where the particular suspect has been detained. Whereas if there was a central database of the police, you could simply just type in the name of the suspect and it brings it out on the system of the police that this particular person has been detained in social social police station. So what should citizens do? Should citizens begin to protest for a centralized police database? What do you suggest? Okay, um, before you ask, before you answer, DG, um, to our participants, please kindly know that you can ask questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and put your questions forward to the speaker. So DG, please, you can answer now. Sorry, I was muted. I was muted now. Like I said, it's a shame, but really, we do not have, um, the police do not have centralized database for detainees of detainees. And so, in fact, what you're asking for is more like an electronic database such that so somebody is arrested somewhere, you can, I mean, they can just check in any of their stations and tell you where it is. It's worse. You would find that even records of detainees for some 10 years ago, you cannot even, you may not even be able to find it in the police stations. I would not be surprised, I, they do not have it. You'll find that those records sometimes are not just properly kept. Now, what you are asking for is a very tall order, trust me. And sadly, these were some of the concerns of the NSAS protesters. The fact that the Nigerian police force needed very deep, all-encompassing reforms that would see to better funding, improved training, and more uh, 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 um, uh, tech, uh, available technology, technological tools to the police to ease their work and to make them a lot more effective. Now, some of the things that were complained about during the NSAS protest, for instance, indiscriminate arrest at checkpoints, profiling, discrimination, uh, and then, you know, extortion. I will tell you quite categorically, I know this because I have spoken to several policemen who have confirmed this. These things, it's business. It's not anything but business for them. Now, let me explain. You have a police station that is not given funds to run the station. They don't have money to purchase electricity. They don't have money for generator. They don't have money for fuel. They don't have money for water to run in there. Of course, they have detainees. So you can just imagine how the detainees will be treated in there. So what do they do? They need to go out and make money for these basic things. They need to make money to be able to buy electricity, get generator. And then sometimes you have even have, it's individuals that will come and donate the generator. And you will see donated by XYZ Nigeria Limited. Quite naturally, the day XYZ Nigeria Limited needs to get somebody arrested, even if it is for a civil matter. Oh. They quickly deploy men and officers to go and do his bidding. So you will find that it is actually, that, that rot is so deep, is so enmeshed, is so in there that what we need to do, what would have been needed to do would have required, you know, clearing away the entire hierarchy, the entire uh, um, uh, um, hierarchy of the force to replace them with new, 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 fresh blood, fresh ideas. And that would also require that governments must be committed to proper funding of the police, such that some of these things that lead them into going around to get to do these things, to source for funds, in quote. I tell you, prosecutors come to court and they don't, they don't have money for, they are not given money for transportation from the, from the office. So if you have a case with the police, if you have a case with the police, for instance, you're a complainant and your matter is in court, and you do not make arrangement for the prosecutor to go to court, you're on your own. Your case will suffer. More so, the prosecutor is already overburdened. Some prosecutors one day sometimes has 12 cases, 13, 15 cases in one day. In various courts, not in one court. In various courts, in Buari, 
it will say zone two and then zone six and then in quali 12 cases 13 15 cases so of course naturally he's going to prioritize so if he tells you there's no transport and you don't bring transport money it won't go for your case and the other man brings twenty thousand naira for transport he would rather go for that case so it's a simple thing it is not about interest it's not about anything it is where he is able to go because and that happens only because he is not given the funds to do his job from the office. Besides, why would you have one prosecutor? I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Why would you have one prosecutor handling 12 cases in one day? So, of course, you're going to expect sloppiness in the prosecution of cases. You're going to expect shoddiness in the presentation of evidence. And you're even going to make it naturally. See, we write briefs every day. If you want to write charges and in one night you are writing 12 charges after having gone to attend to like 12 cases all over the day, you will be tired. You will be... So you will naturally find even defective charges. So that also explains to you why at the end of the day you have a very poor rate of even uh, 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 conviction. So it is important for the government, if we want to have things like what you are talking about, um, a detailed cons electronic database of detainees, the, um, suspects, convicts, and all of this, then there must be funding. There must be proper funding. There must be proper training for men and officers of the police force. And of course, the welfare of these men must also improve. I told someone, if you go to the, in one of uh, we had a training, with um, some police officers last month. And one of the men told me that, look, if you come to the barrack and see how some of these officers live in the barracks, so when you complain about the, when you complain about the, the, the cells, they don't understand what you're talking about. I mean, it's okay. Because where they live, it's probably not better than that. So they, do, they don't know why you're making a fuse out, the force out of I mean, this I mean, relatively okay place. So you will see that, um, because you know, Nemo that called non habit, um, you cannot give what you do not have. It is important that the welfare of these men is also taken care of. And we're not just talking about welfare in terms of salaries, we're talking about in terms of their habitation and in terms of post-service welfare. Some of them too, the fear of tomorrow, when I retire, or should I die in service? Who takes care of my children? Who takes care of my wife? And all of that. So you will see that these are some of the things. These were the agitations, some part of the agitations of the NSAS protesters. Unfortunately, the government used even the police to ensure that they, they suspended the protests. Yeah, because it is not a suspect. It is uh, not uh, over. I assure you, it is still coming back. And I'm sure even the government, as it is at the moment, must know that um, I remember like two weeks ago, the Senate president said that none of them will survive a second answer. And I think he was speaking prophetically. Because, um, you know, when you repress the people for too long and they come out, they get to a point where it is either death or life. So you may find that people may no longer be afraid of any of the threats that the government is putting up anymore. And government will have no choice eventually but to bow down to the demands of the protesters. Okay, thank you very much, DG. Okay, so our time is fast spent, but from what you've said and from what you've discussed, we can see that the constitution is clear, but we have administrative bottlenecks making ensuring that the constitution is not enforced properly. I have a final question, DG. But let me say, I have two questions rather. The first, what then is the role of judges in enforcing these rights, particularly considering where the judges have to apply discretion? For instance, on the issue of remand proceedings, I feel that magistrates should be able to apply discretion to grant or not to grant remand applications by subjecting the police to the test of equity. Equity says, if who comes to equity must come with clean hands. 
if the police do not follow the constitution, I feel the magistrate should not grant remand applications. For instance, the constitution says a suspect must be charged before the court no less than 48 hours after, no more than 48 hours after being arrested. We find cases where the police simply charges suspects 10 days after they've been arrested. So in that instance, I think the magistrate should apply discretion to say you did not follow the constitution, so you shouldn't benefit from a remand application. That's one part. On the second part, my question is as regards citizen advocacy. How far do you think citizen advocacy can go to get specific results? For instance, we need Section 89 of the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act to be expunged from that particular act. We need the police to have a database. How do you expect, or what, how far do you think citizen advocacy can go? And what do you think citizens can do specifically to get results? Those are the two questions before we round up for the day. Let me, first, as regards the issue of uh, judges or magistrates and their discretion. You know, I had said earlier that um, where there is no accountability, impunity certainly will reign. And um, even, this applies even to the judiciary. For instance, I spoke about a case where the act says a person can be remanded in the first instance for 15 days. A magistrate grants a remand order against someone and then adjourns the case for almost 90 days. That is clearly in breach of the, of the act. And in cases like that, what I expect is that petitions will be done against such a magistrate, such a judge, to the appropriate authorities, and I mean the uh, judicial authorities, such that um, such a magistrate should be punished. If a magistrate is punished like that, it's going to serve as a lesson to the others. But if they are not punished, then that kind of impunity will persist. That's on one hand. Now, in the exercise of their discretion, of course, I, like I said, we did some research on this and some of the magistrates, some of their fears, some of their worries too, is such that, oh, they don't want the situation where they exercise their discretion and in exercising it, for instance, they order the release of a suspect and it turns out that the suspect is a hardcore criminal and then something goes wrong and then they are now held responsible for allowing the suspect go. And then, of course, probably the society suspects that they probably have been compromised and things like that. But there is one thing that I, yeah, I, I, I said to a few of the magistrates I interacted with, and I will say again, it is that as long as your discretion, the law makes provision for discretion, and the law understands that Discretion is not, does not mean, when you exercise your discretion, it does not mean that you'll be right at all times. It simply means that you would have taken all necessary precautions. You would have convinced yourself such that you can convince anybody else that the decision you are taking is based on very reasonable grounds. So if you want to exercise your discretion, and in doing so, you do so judicially and judiciously. And as it turned out, somebody, a notorious criminal, gets to escape the wealth of the law. I don't think anybody will blame you. However, if you do not exercise your discretion judicially and judiciously, that is when problems come. I will make reference to the case some years ago. I can't remember what year, but I think it had to do with um, pensions where someone was convicted of um, mismanaging pension funds, running into billions of Naira, 
And um, the person was convicted by the judge and sentenced to, I can't remember, a term of imprisonment with an option of fine of 750,000 Naira. Of course, the law establishing or creating that offense gave the judge the discretion to sentence within a specific uh, 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 prov uh, prov uh, provision. And what the judge decided was within the ambit of that uh, provision. And so, legally speaking, what he did was very right because he exercised the his discretion within what is provided for. The question, however, is that did he exercise that discretion judiciously for someone who is said, who is convicted of having embezzled billions of Naira, you now give him an option of fine of 750,000 Naira. Of course, I am not sure if most of you know what happened there. The man paid there and there in court. He paid there and then in court because that's very little money for him. I mean, for, for him, this is beautiful. That was probably much more than what he paid his lawyers. Definitely more than what he paid his lawyer. So why not? So we have cases of this kind of, um, and this will take me to the next, it will take me to your next question. When this happened, there was a massive outcry out there amongst the citizens as a result of which the National Judicial Council had to um, punish the judge by placing him on suspension for two or three years or thereabouts because there was an outcry. This is where I will now jump into citizen advocacy. You see, our recent experience has taught us that we have powers. We have more power than the government does as citizens. In fact, we give them, we are the ones who give them the power that they exercise and we can take it back. Now, citizens' advocacy has achieved so much in the past, in the past few years that I have seen. Attempts to enact laws, attempts to bring in some policies, attempts to do quite a lot of things. And while we may not have seen much of citizens' advocacy bringing about um, uh, amendments of existing laws, I assure you of one thing based on the progressive development we are seeing in the way citizen advocacy is being done in Nigeria. It's only a matter of time. Section 89 of the Sheriffs and Civil Process Act is one which ordinarily would not be amended by the legislatures, by the legislature without citizen advocacy. It is important that the citizens come out to ask and demand that that section is not for the people and must be expunged. But again, you must also understand that you cannot have citizens advocacy when the citizens themselves are not aware. So it is also important that civil society organizations like BNLF and um, other organizations, Nigerian Bar Association, uh, Young Lawyers Forum, and so on and so forth, must take it upon themselves to take the message out and make, you know, in simple infographics, in simple flyers, make the citizens understand the, de the, the dangers that Section 89 of the Sheriffs and Civil Process Act portend for us as citizens and for the enforcement of our rights. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, DG. And Sonia has a question, one of our, one of our viewers. She says, considering the recent events of the NSAS protests, are you aware? Of any, of, are you aware of any proceedings that has come out of such protests? As in, she's saying, are you aware of any claims being brought against the police, army, or government with respect to several infringements of human rights at the recent NSAS protests? Are you aware of any any NSAS protests yes, that has brought you, I'm actions I'm against the Nigerian police? I, I am aware. Uh, I am aware of some people who have filed petitions with uh, some of the 
about 30 various uh, um, panels, judicial panels of inquiry set up by the states. I am also aware of some pending cases in courts. In fact, I am aware that there are some there are ongoing efforts to organize um, pro bono legal services provider. I know that in Lagos State, the Office of Public Defender was doing quite some sizable amount of work in, um, uh, in, uh, in enforcing the rights of those who were arrested during the protests. So that's uh, something. Yes, I know of some of this. I know of some of this. Okay, thank you very much, DG. Um, I, I, without further questions, I think we've all gained a lot, and this session has been an enlightening one. Um, once again, the British Nigeria Law Forum is a bilateral organization which serves as a communication forum between British and Nigerian lawyers for their mutual benefits and the promotion of legal ideals. You can tweet at us using the hashtags hashtag BNLF and hashtag BNLFGLD. Okay, so I think the summary of the entire discussion is that the Constitution of Nigeria, the 1999 Constitution, has made provision for these rights. These rights are clearly spelled out. But it appears that in reality, administrative bottlenecks are injuring the enforcement of these rights. As such, there needs to be citizen advocacy, and we need to be specific with our demands. First of all, Section 89 of the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act, which makes it almost impossible to get judgment or enforce judgment against the Nigerian police and other federal agencies. Such section has to be expunged from the Sheriff and Civil Processes Act and it can only come about by amendments by the legislature. Also, we need a database from the police. And these also can only come back with the treasure from the citizens. So thank you very much. Once again, thank you for participating. And we thank our speaker, DG Ajari, for having us and for giving us this enlightening session. Thank you very much. And I think we'll call it a day. Please note once again that this recording will be uploaded on YouTube or the PNLF website should you choose to watch it again. Thank you very much. Thank you so Good much. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure being here tonight. Thank you.